We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. When I see a bumper video like that, it kind of screams, wake up, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in our world and in our culture that we're talking about right now in this series called This Means War. I'm really glad that you are here. Uh, I'm glad to see this room as full as it is. Uh, it's really great to see God's people coming. You know, one of my favorite things when I stand out on the porch of the church and watch cars coming into the parking lot and watching uh, our church family gathering and, and kind of moving into this place, one of the things that warms my heart is I know that the thing that unites us is that all of us are on a quest for what's true. We come into this room because we want to hear the truth. We don't want to be lied to. We want to come to a place where we know you can gather with other believers and, and put your arms around each other and say, you know what, we stand for truth in this place and in this church. And that's what we're talking about in this series. We're talking about some of the places where our culture is, is trying to cram some lies into what we know is not true because we stand on the Word of God together. Uh, let me uh, share a quote with you before we get into today's message. Martin Luther, one of our you know, powerhouses of the faith, right, says this, if I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except that point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly, I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefields besides that is merely flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. You see, as followers of Christ, if you're in this room right now and you're one of my brothers and sisters in Christ, it's important for us to know where the battle is raging so that instead of us being faithful to God somewhere else, we can be faithful to God in the war that's being fought in our culture. And so I'm glad you're here. Uh, we need to realize that there is a war going on in this culture around us. Let me show you a few passages of scripture that really highlight the truth that all of us are soldiers in a battle. One great example is 1 Timothy 6, 12 says, fight the good fight for the true faith. You see it right there. Every one of you, listen, if you're a brother or sister in Christ, you've been charged to fight the good fight. That's what a soldier does. All right, how about this next one? 1 Corinthians 16 says this. Oh, how did that get up there? Sometimes when you're in charge of the slides, you slip a few things in there that you're excited about. Uh, I don't know how that got in there. I'm so sorry. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. All right, how about 1 Timothy 1.18? Did it happen again? <laughs> yeah. This is the last one. Uh, yesterday, we celebrated uh, my oldest daughter's graduation. And so, uh, yeah. All right, no more of those. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. What do all these verses have in common? There's others I could have pulled from. I just grabbed a few, ultimately to point out the truth that we are in a war. There is a cultural war going on around us, 
And it's important to know what's going on, what the strategies are, who the enemy is, who the enemy is not, and how we can stand firm as we fight in this war. Now, it's important to note, we're not trying to claim that this is a new war, that this cultural war that we're in right now, that it's just something that just popped up over the last 15 years or just this past year, and we thought we should talk about it. No, that's not true. This war actually predates sin. Even before Eve took the first bite from the tree she wasn't supposed to, it says the serpent was already out there fighting the battle and trying to to trip up God's plans. The war predates sin. It goes back a long ways, all right? And so we got to realize that. This isn't a new battle that we're fighting. Now, what happens for a lot of us, we We find ourselves in a cultural war. We find ourselves up against giants, right? And we're thinking, well, well, I I, I wish we had a David. I wish we could have a young shepherd boy who had the courage to go stand up against this giant because David could get us out of this mess. Or maybe you're thinking, I wish we had a Moses in our community who could go up to the Pharaoh boldly and say, let my people go. I wish we had an Elijah who could just call down fire from heaven and just fix this whole thing, right? I wish we, and and our instinct is to think about some of the giants of the faith and, and wish that we had them with us today to help us fight our battle. The truth is they were in their moment in history to fight their battle, and God has you in this moment in history to fight yours. I want you to picture Uncle Sam with his finger pointed at you right now when it's coming to recruiting for the Lord's army, I want you. You are David. You are Elijah. You are the Moses of now. They're all watching from heaven cheering you on. But we got our own battle to fight. It's not a new battle. It's not a new war. But we got our own thing going on and we got to be aware of what's happening. So today... We're going to cover the war on God, the war that our culture is fighting on God. Uh, A couple weeks ago, we talked about the war on truth. Last week, uh, we talked about the war on family. Today, how is our culture, how is the war, how is the evil one, Satan himself, fighting this battle on the concept of the one true God? Now, our culture today has all sorts of things it's trying to convince you of, right? That there is no God, that God is dead, or even that it's fine to believe in a divine, supernatural God, but just whatever you do, make sure it's not the God of the Bible, because that one we don't like. You can believe in some other gods. There's a lot of actually religions out there that if you, if you stand against their gods, boy, you get canceled real quick. But you stand up for your God and you get canceled for some reason, real quick. You see, the one true God of the Bible is under attack in our culture. And I want to explore that a little bit this morning and explore some of the strategies of how God is under attack and how Satan is doing that. Let me give you a few statistics. You know that just in the last 20 years, I'm not talking about 2,000 years, I'm talking about two zero, two sets of 10 years According to Pew Research, the number of people who claim to be atheists in the United States has doubled from 15% to 30%. If you look at some of the, another statistic, and by the way, that's the highest that Pew Research has ever found. Their latest research, the greatest number of atheism, those who claim to not have any belief in God, the highest they've ever found since they've been polling. Now, now, atheists today, of those 65 and older, 9% claim to be atheists. But of those between the ages of 18 to 29, 32% claim to be atheists. And so what we see is that our younger generation specifically is under attack, more so than any other generation. As this number is growing, we see one of the strategies of the evil one, which we'll talk a little bit more about next week. Next week, we're going to talk about the war on education. We're going to see a little bit of why that's true. Now, we also understand, I think, the method of delivery. 
as missiles are being fired into a Christian worldview, our understanding of, of a one true God of the Bible, as missiles are being fired, we understand, uh, if, if you will, essentially the method of delivery. They're, they're coming from the media, they're coming from Hollywood, they're coming from the education system, they're coming from all sorts of different places. But I think we all have eyes big enough, open enough to see where these attacks are coming from. But the question is, do we understand how, like what is actually being delivered, how these lies are being delivered, the strategy that Satan is using to fight this war on God? And essentially, it's, it's a proxy war. I don't know if you're familiar with what a proxy war is, but instead of uh, fighting your actual enemy, you attack things that are important to your enemy. You attack, uh, for example, if I wanted to attack you, but I didn't want to attack you directly, I know I could do a lot of harm to you if I attacked some things that were important to you. If I fought a war against an ally of yours, or I, 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 I picked on your family, w- would you all agree that one of the worst things, I, if I wanted to really hurt you, I could attack your family, and that would probably do more damage than if I attacked you directly, huh? Satan knows that in his war against God, his best strategy is not to attack God directly. That's not going to go well. So what he does is he attacks things about God. He attacks truths of God. He attacks God's people, God's word. And we're going to talk about some of those things today. So here's the first thing, the strategy that Satan uses when he's attacking God. Again, he's not going to attack God directly. He's too smart for that. He attacks God's creation. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to try to convince people that all the incredible things that God has made, he's going to try to get us to to take off God's signature at the bottom corner of this incredible piece of art and remove it and give someone else credit for all that has been created. Satan attacks God's creation. I'm sure you're familiar with the name Charles Darwin, right? Charles Darwin wrote the book, The Origin of Species. Did you know that before Darwin was a biologist who wrote this book as an atheist, that Charles Darwin was actually a theologian and a pastor? Did you know that? He was a pastor and a theologian at first. He was an amateur biologist at first. I would say he remained an amateur biologist because he didn't come to great conclusions. But something happened in his life. He lost a child. One of his children died. And in the morning of that, in the hurt of that, he didn't have a Stephen minister to help him through that like you all have access to now. And so with all that pain and all that hurt, he turned from God instead of to God, and he came to a point where he made a claim, a bold claim that there is no God. And then he wrote a book, essentially trying to write God out of creation. He was writing God out of history, in a way, writing God out of his own story, his story, God's story. That was his strategy. Out of anger, out of frustration, he wrote a book that we now teach as truth in schools, essentially trying to write God out of the creation account, wipe him out. Do you know that just 170 years ago, creationism was taught as the primary understanding for where all things came from? God was actually credited for creation in public schools just 170 years ago. Now, I want to show you a little bit of the digression of why Satan would attack God's creation in order to attack God. If you go to, in your Bible, uh, the book of Romans, it's in the New Testament. You're going to find it right after the Gospels and right after the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and you're going to find the book of Romans. If you look at the very first chapter of Romans in verse 20, you're going to see this digression why would Satan want to attack God's creation? All right, here, here we go. In verse 20, it says this. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly, underline that word in your Bible, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. 
What Paul is simply saying here is just by opening up your eyes and looking at the glory of creation, the beauty of creation, you look down at the human hand and you look at the complexities of what was put together and there's, it's clearly, it's plainly obvious that God created, that there was something supernatural at least that created all things. Something incredible created all of this. It says right there, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. No excuse at all. If we keep reading, what happens next in this digression? Verse 21 says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. They instead became utter fools. Do you see the strategy that Satan has? He says, listen, if I can attack creation, I can actually get people to write God's name out of this story. I can be attacking God basically indirectly. The people, they, they stopped worshiping God. They, they, they wouldn't give him thanks for what he had done and he had created. And then even worse, they started to come up with their own ideas about God was, what God was like. Do you know what happens when we come up with our own ideas about what God is like? Every single time, when we come up with our own ideas about what God is like, we create a God that looks an awful lot like us. We create a God that likes the same things we like that thinks the same way we think, that feels the same way we feel. We create ourselves. We basically set ourselves up as an idol and say, right, it's much easier just to worship myself. And this is what the people are doing when they reject the truth that is plainly in front of them, that God made all things. And then it goes on in verse 23. It says, instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds, and animals, and reptiles. And so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. You have to... You can't miss this, this digression of what happens. And, and Romans chapter 1 actually goes on and creates just a list of depravity, of how when you reject the creation of God, when Satan gets you to, to reject the, the fact that God created all things, what happens is this, this slow deterioration of, of human morality, Satan is attacking God by attacking his creation and by convincing you that you were not made in the image of God, that your neighbor was not made in the image of God, that all things were not made on purpose with a reason by God for his glory and his purpose. If he can get you to not believe that, watch what I can get God's people to do to each other if they just think they're a big clump of cells. You see, God wants to get people to worship Satan wants to get people to worship what was created instead of the God who did the creating. And it leads to some really bad places. Have you ever heard of this phrase called irreducible complexity? Anyone study apologetics and have heard irreducible complexity before I see one hand over here? All right, will you stand up and explain it? Just kidding. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Um. Let me, let me explain irreducible complexity real quick. This is one of my favorite arguments when someone says, you know what, I just believe in this process, this natural process of evolution that, that over billions of years, we've all just kind of evolved from a single cell, something that came out of this explosion, and then here we are. 
right? And they, and they follow this Darwinian explanation that we, uh, that, uh, that a thing, so here's the, the idea, right? That there's a thing and then it has an offspring and that offspring has some mutations to it, right? And some of those mutations are helpful and that makes the thing actually more likely to survive than another thing might have a mutation that makes it less likely to survive. And so the one that's less likely to survive, well, that one dies off and the one that's more likely to survive lives on and has offspring. And before we know it, all those great mutations have taken over and here we are. But think about this concept of irreducible complexity. If you take the human eyeball for just a moment, think about the human eyeball. The human eyeball has seven different parts to it. All of them have to work for you to be able to see. I would love to get Charles Darwin on this stage. And be like, so you basically want us to believe that at some point there was a mutation where all seven of these parts of a human eyeball worked simultaneously. Because if only one of them mutated the right direction at, at one moment, that organism wasn't any more able to see than something that didn't have that mutation. So why did that thing survive? And then why, when it survived, why did that next... Seven parts all needed to mutate and then work together in order for this organism to be able to see. It's called irreducible complexity. You can't, you can't break it down into small parts over billions of years because at the end of the day, the whole theory falls apart. You see, the truth is that you are so beautifully unique and complex. This universe is so fine-tuned and wonderful that if things were just a little bit different, everything would fall apart. And why is that? It's because you were not an accident. You were made on purpose in the image of God by a God who put everything together just so life would be possible. And so your eye would be able to see. And so your hands would be able to grab. If you have any questions about whether or not there's a God, just find a newborn baby and stare at that thing for a minute. So beautiful to watch how all those ligaments and muscles and bones and just, y'all, you were not an accident. But Satan would love for you to believe that you were just an accident that mutated over billions of years. Because by doing so, what is he doing? He's attacking God himself. He's attacking God. Here's the second thing that Satan attacks. Satan attacks God by attacking God's word. If you can get people to reject what God has said, if you can get people to disregard the word of God, well, you can just... That's one of the best ways. This is how God actually reveals himself to people. God has revealed himself in his word to us. If we can get people to reject God's word, well, what a wonderful way to get them to reject God altogether. This has been Satan's strategy since the very beginning. This is the first strategy we see of Satan and how he attacks God is by attacking his word. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1, it says, the serpent, that's Satan, he was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, this is Eve, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Now, let me be really plain about this. I want you to know that Satan knows God's word better than you do. He knows that it is the infallible word of God. He knows right now that he's already misquoting God. Did God really say, you're not supposed to eat from any of these trees? Satan already knows that's not what God said. God said, don't eat from the one tree. So he's already trying to trip up Eve, attacking God's word. And then so Eve replies, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. And if you do, you will die. Now notice what the serpent does here. He says, your God is a liar. How do, he, does, he doesn't say it that plainly though, does he? He says, you won't die. 
The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. What the serpent does here is what the serpent always does, what he's still doing today. If he can get you to take words of God and disregard them, believe that they're not true, that's the first thing he does. And then what does he do? He actually takes God's word and say, God didn't say that. Or, or God, that's, God's actually trying to keep something from you. He's not telling you the truth. One thing, he, he adds to God's word and he re- removes from God's word. He, he takes away from God's word and then he adds his own truth on there. He adds on the, oh, if you just eat from it, what God didn't say is that you will be like God. You see, what Satan wants to do in this world And what he wants to do in your life, he wants to try to trick you into thinking that God's word isn't reliable, it's not worth learning, it's not worth studying, it's not worth knowing, because we can't, God doesn't tell us the truth. Satan is trying to ban this Bible, he's trying to keep people from reading it, he's trying to censor it. It was just recently on social media, I saw an image that was a sensitive content. Are you sure you want to see this? And what do we all do when we see a sensitive content image? Of course now I want to see it. We click on it, and it was scripture. Sensitive content. Listen, I want you to understand this series, the reason we're doing it, it's not to, to be offensive for offensiveness sake. We're not just trying to see how many people as a Rundle Christian church we can offend in our community. That's not why we're doing this. We have to understand that there's something powerful about the word of God. In fact, think about Jesus' own words. In Matthew chapter 10, this is what Jesus says. He says, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, please don't think that I came to bring peace. That's not the reason I'm here. He says... I came not to bring peace, but a, but a what? What is it? A sword. He says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. You see, the Bible, actually, in, in Scripture, we actually learn that one of the, the phrases for this book, one of the words that we use to describe this book is a double-edged sword. The Bible is a sword. Why do we call it that? Because a sword is able to divide between the truth and the lies. The Bible is able to help you establish what's real and what's not. It's able to to be a, a guide for you in your life to determine what is worth following and what's worth rejecting. And Jesus says, listen, I came and I'm bringing with me the word of God. I'm bringing, and every word out of my mouth is a spoken word of God. I'm bringing a sword. And we have access to God's revelation in our hands. We have access to know what's real and what's not, what's true and what's not, what's good and what's not. And Satan loves to attack God's word because in doing so, he causes a lot of damage. If you can get a whole church to reject this book and what it teaches, can you imagine the damage that's done? There are churches out there that don't teach that this book is the word of God. It's not this one. This book teaches that we can rely on this book as truth. In fact, that's the good news. In 1 Peter 1.25, it says, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And the word is the good news that was preached to you. What do we know about this book? It's not going anywhere. And it is true. And it is worth building your life upon, church. You know, this is the most accurately copied historical book of all time. It was written over 14,000, a span of over 14, not thousand, 1,400 years. Three different languages, 40 different authors. You know that there are over 23,000 archaeological digs that back up facts, historical facts that are, that are mentioned in this book. Like there's never been a more backed up, uh, reliable source of, of history ever created. And why? Because God wanted to keep this thing intact for you to know more about him. 
If you want to study more on that, come ask me. I'll, I'll give you some books to read about why you can trust that God's word is accurate and true and reliable for your life. Satan wants to attack it because he wants to attack God. Here's a third thing. Sorry about this cold, y'all. Um, the third thing that Satan wants to attack is God's son. And I've mentioned, right, if you wanted to, to do something really nasty to me, the best way to do it would be to hurt my wife or my kids. If you want to come into my home and you want to kill somebody, please pick me. That's my preference, all right? And so Satan knows if I really want to attack God, I can attack the son. I can attack his son. That's, that's a, and you might be thinking right now, well, I, I, yeah, he's probably going to talk about when Satan was trying to tempt Jesus or when Satan uh, had Jesus crucified on a cross. Those are some pretty powerful attacks on God's son. But that's not what I want to talk about in this moment. You see, Jesus made a really bold claim in his time on earth. John 14, verse 6. Will you guys read this verse out loud with me? We're going to have it up on the screen. I want you all to say this together. It says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That has got to be one of the uh, boldest statements that Jesus ever made while on this earth. He essentially says, listen, if you want to be restored to God the Father, there's only one way to do it. It's not wide. It's quite narrow. You've got to go through Jesus, is what Jesus said. Very offensive to a lot of people. Because there's a lot of faith systems out there that want to take the concept of Jesus and get you to, to either reject the fact that you've got to go through Jesus to get to God, or they take the person of Jesus and twist Jesus around so much that you're not even talking about the same person anymore. See, Satan wants to attack Jesus because Jesus is the only way to the Father. If you can get Jesus all messed up in people's minds, if you can get them to question if Jesus is real, if you can get them to question whether or not that, or get them to worship some Jesus that's not even the Jesus of the Bible, man, you can do a lot of damage. Think about some other faith systems that are out there right now. I'll give you a short list. The faith system of Islam, right? They, they believe that Jesus was just a prophet and a wise teacher, yet not the son of God. That's not the Jesus I worship. In Buddhism and Hinduism, they believe that Jesus was a holy man but not unique in that regard. There were a lot of other holy men in their faith systems. That's not the Jesus I worship. And Jehovah's Witnesses, how about this? They teach that Jesus is Michael the archangel. That's not the Jesus I worship. In the Mormon tradition, they teach that Jesus is Lucifer's brother and that both of them are children of the heavenly mother and heavenly father. That's not the Jesus that I read about in scripture and that I worship. Let me uh, talk about Mormons for just a moment. I have some, some of my dearest friends. In fact, one of my best friends from high school was a Mormon. One of the most upright, upstanding, kindest men I've ever met in my life. Really, really good people. And I've had some really hard conversations with some of my Mormon friends who are saying, listen, we're Christians too. Why, why do we have to debate this? We, we have a Bible just like yours. We got some extra ones, but we got yours, right? We got that we believe that Jesus died on the cross for sin. We believe these things. So why, why do you claim that we're not Christians? And at the end of the day, when you look at who they believe Jesus was and who Jesus is, it's not the same person that I know Jesus to be based on the truth of God's word. Satan has attacked God's son in their theology to the place where we're not worshiping the same Jesus. And so we've talked about how Satan attacks God's creation and how he attacks God's word and how he attacks God's son, all this proxy warfare. What I want to do is, is close with our what now, God? What do we do as a church with this information? How do we 
take all this information and do something meaningful with it? How do we apply this to our lives? And let me read a passage. It's four verses in Ephesians chapter six that really are like the ultimate example of warfare in scripture. It says a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, you will be standing firm. So with that scripture up on the screen, I wanna show you four things I think you should apply to your life as we're fighting this war on God together. The first thing is this, church, don't rely on your own strength. Ephesians 6 reminds you to, to do this in the Lord's mighty power, in his mighty power. You know, one of my favorite scenes in, uh, in Braveheart, you know, where William Wallace has got his, half of his face painted blue and he's on his horse and the whole army is there and they're kind of like outnumbered and they're discouraged. And William Wallace is riding back and forth on his horse and he's yelling out at this speech, right? And some of you know exactly what he says. I wrote it down, right? He says, tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they may never take our freedom. Mel Gibson does a much better job with it, right? It's just like any good football movie. You know, a football movie always ends with a big game. They're always down at half, at the halfway mark, right? And so there they are at halftime and they're in the locker room and the best part of any football movie is the speech that happens in the locker room. This right here is Paul giving a, a halftime speech to the church. This is him saying, listen, a final word. Church, go out there and be strong. But I don't want you to be strong with your own power. I want you to be strong in God's mighty power. Don't rely on your own strength. Rely on his strength. That's why in, in 2 Timothy 1.7, right, it says God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. You know why you don't have to have a spirit of fear? You're not moving with your own power. You have God's power. Here's the second thing. Don't rely on your own protection. Just like you don't rely on your own strength. Don't rely on your own defense either. Don't rely on your own offense. Don't rely on your own defense. You know, in a, the, the animated Lion King, where you got baby Simba and he's standing there and he, uh, he has the hyenas about to attack him and he goes, Rawr! and they all laugh at him. And then he tries again and this mighty roar comes out of him and you realize it's not actually coming from him. It's coming from his dad, right? He's standing behind him. Well, scripture says, in fact, I want you to think about this for a moment. When you know who is behind you, the fear of what's in front of you disappears. When you know who's behind you, the fear of what's in front of you disappears. If you go into a fight with your own offense and your own defense, it's like going into a gunfight with a knife. You don't do it. Go in with God's mighty power and with his armor on. Here's a third thing I wanna encourage you to do. Number three, don't confuse the weapon with the enemy. The weapon is not the enemy. The Bible says that the person that's getting on your nerves, that neighbor who's, that's picking on you on social media, who thinks your worldview is, 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 is ridiculous or whatever, that person sometimes feels like the enemy. But scripture says your enemy is not flesh and blood. That person is just a weapon that the enemy is using to get your goat. 2 Corinthians 4 
gives us a really powerful reminder in verse four. It says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. If you looked at someone who you feel like is the enemy, someone who's attacking your worldview, who's poking fun at the Bible, who thinks you're ridiculous for believing in one true God that you can only access through Jesus, if you look at that person with the fresh eyes of seeing them, not as the enemy, but as someone the enemy has blinded and is using as a weapon against you. You know, in a battle, when your side defeats the other side and you march over into their camp and you open up their armory and there's a bunch of guns and missiles and grenades and all sorts of stuff in there, guess whose weapons those are now? They're yours. The weapon's not the enemy. We would love for the weapons that the enemy is using to be part of the arsenal of God, right? So don't confuse the weapon with the enemy. And the fourth thing is this. Don't worry about the outcome, church. Ephesians 6, 13 ends with, at the end of all this, you will be standing firm. You will be standing firm. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray. And then when I'm done praying, some of you are gonna be like, I know how this works, it's time to go. <laughs> We're gonna go a little late this service because we have 14 families that are gonna dedicate some babies this morning. How we are all gonna fit on the stage, I have no idea. But I'm gonna ask that you stay put uh, because then after we, we get to dedicate these babies, we get to celebrate some of our graduates also. So we're gonna go late. Tell your stomach to be quiet. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to open up your word. Thank you for an opportunity we have to see the strategies of the devil. Your word says that when we open up your word and, and study it, that we'll be able to know the strategies of the evil one and we'll be able to stand against those strategies. So Father, I pray that you wouldn't let us be tripped up by those strategies, that you would help us to know that as he's trying to attack your creation, as he's trying to attack uh, your word, and as he's trying to attack the validity of your son's promise, that he is the only way back to you. We recognize that if he can succeed in those, he can make a lot of, do a lot of damage, but we know that as a family of Christ, we're gonna be standing firm at the end if we put on your protection and your armor and don't confuse the enemy with the weapon. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.